Hey, church family, it is Friday at about 11.05 as I'm recording this, and I'm recording to an empty room except for Jordan and baby Addie back there. So Kelly and me and the boys, we're going to be out of town this Sunday as you're watching this. So I'm filming this way, so make sure you've got one of these bulletins in front of you. We're walking through the Bible this year, 52 major stories of the Bible. So today we're talking about Gideon. You should see one with a picture of this, Nicolas Poisson. On the front, 16th century painter from France, painting the Battle of Gideon and Midian. So we're going to be walking through together, and it says, Strength made perfect in weakness. Obviously, that's become an important theme for me over the years. So we're coming out of Judges chapter 6. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So remember, we've had the exodus, Joshua and Jericho, they've gone in the promised land. But by Judges chapter 2, we've learned that the descendants of Joshua and Moses, all those people, those descendants, they're already not following God. And so the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, says verse 1, and for 70 years he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. The Midianites were a nearby people. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepare, prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. So if you ever remember some old westerns where the gunslingers roll into the small town and they're waiting for some savior to come save them and kill, out, kill off all the gunslingers that are stealing from everyone... That's what's going on here. They're growing their crops, and the Midianites just come in right as the crops are about ready, and they steal them, and they run off like invaders. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So if you ever read this, the book of Judges, it, it is by far the most violent book in all of the Bible. And the theme over and over and over is God's people, they, have, they forget his ways, they forget him, they forget his miracles, they don't listen, they turn to the idolatrous nations and they follow their practices, and it gets really bad and they cry out, God save us. God sends someone to save them, and then it gets really bad. It's just this cycle of them continuing to forget, to, to follow the ways of their God, Yahweh. The angel of the Lord, so, so here's this, path, this picture, it's really bad, they're asking for God to help, a prophet comes in and says, look, it's bad for you because you're not following God, and then scene change. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, that's Ophrah, not Oprah, and so we're, we're reading about how bad things are, and then all of a sudden this angel, doo -doo -doo, he's just coming and he's going to sit under a tree, it's a weird segue to a whole new scene sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Gideon's name, it's probably a nickname, by the way. It means hacker, not like computer hacker, but like hacking. Um, and we read about that story in a little bit. So here's a picture of a wine press. This one was well, certainly after uh, the time of Midian or of uh, Gideon, but it looks pretty similar, basically. And so you can see there's kind of lines in the side um, where the water runs down, and it all goes into the center there. And then they can bucket out the uh, the juice from the grapes. So he's down in the bottom of one of these, and he's trying to pound the wheat to separate the kernel from the chaff. This is an incredibly difficult thing because you need wind. You want the wind to separate and blow away the light chaff and leave the heavy kernel. So this is a difficult task. And if you're reading this as an ancient reader, you're supposed to read, 
wait, this doesn't look right. Why is he doing this? Why is he working below ground, literally? Because he doesn't want to be seen by the Midianites who come and pirate their stuff. And so he's, he's hiding, basically. He's in fear of the Midianites. And the angel says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So the first readers are supposed to laugh at this. He's not acting mighty. He's acting pretty afraid. And the angel of the Lord is just speaking on behalf of God. Really, remember, angel, if we get the word angel from the Greek angelos, which just means messenger. And so whatever the angels of God are saying in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you, you can read them as literally speaking on behalf of God. So when an angel says it, it's really God saying it. And so God is saying, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You who are currently hiding from your enemies. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon's got guts here. He's arguing with God. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. He's got guts, but notice he's got a wrong perception of who God is. If God is with us, he asks, he challenges, then why are these bad things happening to us? Apparently in his mind, if God is with me, bad things won't happen to me. This is wrong thinking about who God is. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So he doesn't really argue with that stuff. He just says, go. I'm sending you. Obviously, I'm going to be with you. I've come to you as this angel. I'm obviously with you. I'm obviously sending you. Pardon me, my Lord, he continues to argue. This is really reminiscent of Moses. Moses, God says to Moses, Moses, go. And Moses says, no. And they just argue back and forth. Same type of thing. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and I will strike down all the Midianites leaving none alive. So, first thing you notice in your notes or in your bulletin, God uses ordinary people. Notice verses or Gideon's words in verse 15. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And we get from the picture of what he's doing He's threshing wheat, and he's in a wine press doing it, so he's probably just got a background in, in farming and agriculture. He's not famous, apparently. He's not powerful. He's just a regular old farmer from one of the smallest tribes and the smallest clan within that tribe. He's an ordinary person for his day. God uses ordinary people. Now, notice God didn't see Gideon in his weak state, but saw what Gideon could be on the battlefield when empowered by God. This is a theme that we see God doing. He sees us. He, it's not that he can't, he's not aware of our problems, our weaknesses, our sins. He's obviously aware of it, right? He had to send his son, Jesus, to die for us in our weakness. But he recognizes what we can be in our best. So you see something similar when Paul is addressing the church in Corinth, one of the famously messed up churches. But he calls them saints. They're not acting very saintly, but he recognizes the potential within them through God's power, okay? Now, notice this is from, this is from Corinth, uh, writing to the church in Corinth. Paul says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. We would say something like nobodies to nullify the somebodies so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. 
That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. That's a, that's a very Pauline way of saying every holy thing in us, every righteous thing in us, every apparently redeemed thing in us that has nothing to do with us, that is God working in us and, to be honest, in spite of us. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boasts in the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth hundreds of years later, is picking up on the same theme that we're reading about in Gideon. Gideon has nothing to boast about. He's clearly not a military leader. He's farming. He's afraid of his enemies. He's not anything special. He's not from an important pedigree or lineage, which was so important in those days. And that's who God chooses to use back then, and it still is who God uses today. And even who we think is important in our day is nothing in the eyes of God. The only things that matter is Christ in you, as Colossians says, the hope of glory. Now, notice too, God enables obedience in his people. Let's read about how God instructs Gideon on these next steps. So a little later in chapter 6, that same night the Lord said to him, that is Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal. This is a great example here. This is Gideon, a Jew. His father is a Jew, and they have family altars to other gods. They have strayed far from God. But God, over and over, seeks out his wayward people. And he says, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Baal and Asherah were two gods, prosperity gods, uh, fertility gods that were worship common in the time. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height, this elevated place, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down Offer the second bull as a, as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. He still, he's not acting like a mighty warrior, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole cut down, it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. So God has called Gideon to special service, but before that service can really begin, Gideon must be obedient and turn from these idols and do something pretty bold, cut down the idols in this town. This would be a, a, an important, uh, significant place of worship. And if you cut down the idols, well, anyone who believes in those idols, if you've cut them down, you can't worship those idols. You can't worship those gods. And in the minds of the ancient people, those gods will no longer protect your town. So they want to kill Gideon because of this. They ask each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So notice obeying God, if Gideon is to be faithful to what God has commanded him, obeying God destroys the idols in our life. This is an idol that his father owned, so presumably this is an idol or two idols that he's grown up worshiping. These aren't someone else's idols he's cut down. These are his idols. These are the gods, the false gods that he's been worshiping. And by obeying God, these have to be destroyed. And it's the same for us today. It looks different. We don't build physical idols. And yet there's very much things that occupy the center place in our life. And those are idols. And so to be obedient to God, God calls us to cut them down. Now, here's another point. God's spirit rests on obedient people. Gideon was weak. We see a fearful man, afraid of the Midianites, afraid of other townspeople, so he goes and cuts down the idols at night. He's weak, and he's from a weak lineage, which matter. We don't get that today, but you're not going to be special in the eyes of ancient people if you come from an unspecial place from an unspecial family. You've got to be, to be special, you've got to come from special 
stock. And so in every way, he's viewed as weak. Gideon was weak, but God used him powerfully when God's Spirit came upon him. And so in verse 34 of chapter 6, after Gideon has begun to obey God, it says, then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. So first, God comes to Gideon, sends the angel. God is with you, mighty warrior. So he's come to him. He says, I am with you. He says, I am sending you, but only after obedience, only after doing something bold and risky that could potentially have killed him, does his spirit come on him. So before this, God is with him, but now because of obedience, God's spirit is resting on him. And of course, this is the picture here, similar, the most famous picture of God's spirit resting on people is the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Jesus gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So at some point in the past, I compared Pentecost with the day uh, the Ten Commandments are given, or the day in Jewish thought that it's believed the Ten Commandments were given, the uh, Shav- Feast of Shavuot. And the comparison here, Moses goes up, and they wait days and days for Moses to come down, and they're supposed to be waiting patiently for Moses, and they don't, and they turn from God, and they begin worship- worshiping the false god, the golden calf, and 3,000 people die because they don't obey when they're commanded to wait. In Pentecost, the disciples are told to wait in verse uh, chapter or verse four here, and they do obediently wait, and three thousand people are saved on the day of Pentecost because God's Spirit comes down. So there's something special throughout Scripture. God's Spirit rests on those who obey Him, and in the Old Testament, you see this language, very literal language of God's Spirit leaving people like King Saul when Saul disobeys. God. Now, God instills courage in His people, and often, I put this part in parentheses, often, not always, as we obey Him. So, we start to notice a change in who Gideon is, or in his courage that he exemplifies, after he starts to obey God. At first, he's very fearful of Midianites. He's fearful of townspeople, so he does it at night. And by the end of the story in Gideon of chapter 7, he's quite literally a mighty warrior. This isn't God seeing the best in him. This is now the best is being exemplified and, and being lived out in him. He truly is now a courageous, mighty warrior because God has given him that courage, and with each step that he obeys, he gets more courage. Notice God's angel initially addressed fearful Gideon as a mighty warrior, but in seeing seeing the courageous man Gideon would become. But Gideon's courage increased with each new act of obedience. And each time Gideon saw God's miracles, so there's two stories we don't really talk about tonight. He lays out this fleece. He says, God, how do I know you're going to be with me? I'm going to set out this fleece, and if it's wet and the ground around it is not wet, then I'll believe you. God does it. He says, okay, I need another one. I'm going to set this fleece out again, and if it's dry but the ground around it is wet, then I'll believe you. And so he gains courage from seeing God's hand. This is why we share stories so often at the beginning on Sundays. How have you seen Jesus work? Because as we see God work in our lives, just like Gideon sees God's miraculous hand, we we're, we're receive courage from that just by watching God's hand at work, and he grows in courage. But notice each time Gideon obeyed God's seemingly crazy commands, like reducing army size or another one was cutting down the bales, he grew in courage even more. So this is from Judges chapter 7. Go read Judges 6 and 7 and 8 about the story of, the story of Gideon. We can't cover it all tonight. The Lord said to Gideon, so by this point, Gideon has amassed an army because God has said to Gideon, you are going to defeat the Midianites, and so you need to raise up an army. He raises up a massive army, like 32,000 people, some crazy number. And the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. 
I cannot deliver Midian into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. Remember that boasting language from 1 Corinthians. Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. And then in verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. And so God gives instructions about how to thin the men. The men who dip their heads all the way down in the water, they're to go home as they drink. The men who are thirsty, drinking from the river. But the men who kind of kneel and they cup their hands and it says they lap it like a dog. Preachers have gone on and on about what's this talking about here? It's not really clear, but the the end result is that he leaves, or Gideon starts with thousands upon thousands of men, and he leaves now with 300 men. And so, verse 7, the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, that is lapping water from their hands like a dog, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up Go down against the camp because I am going to give it into your hands. So now he's only got 300 men. He's getting ready. He's at a campsite getting ready to fight thousands of Midianites. And God says, okay, you go into enemy camp and get close to them, close enough to hear them at night. This is a crazy suicide mission that it seems God is sending him on. And he says, oh, if you're afraid, take some with you. But I mean, it's just going to be Gideon and just a few who, there's no way they could, they could fight off all the Midianites in the camp if the Midianites catch them. But he says, go down to the camp. So God is glorified when ordinary people obey an extraordinary God and fulfill his glorious purposes. So the whole story of Gideon is that Gideon is a nobody. He is nothing special. He doesn't view himself special. No one else views him as special. He's an ordinary guy, okay? But he's obeying God. And you see him continue to grow in his his ability, his boldness, to obey some pretty crazy commands from God. And as he does that, as he continues to walk in obedience, God is more and more and more glorified. Because it's really nothing special if you've got several thousand Israelites fighting and defeating several thousand Midianites. But when you've got 300 Israelites who, as the story goes, Gideon gives them instructions. They don't even fight. They take a torch. They take clay jars and trumpets. Remember trumpets from last week with Jericho? This, uh, this instrument of worship. It was an instrument of war too and war cries, but it's an instrument of worship as well. And Gideon says to these 300, we're going to bring trumpets, torches, and pots. And as they march close to the encampment, they start blowing their trumpets, they smash the pots, and they raise up their torches. It's not clear, do they suddenly light the torches, were the torches hiding in the pots, so they just all of a sudden see the flames. And they stand there blowing the trumpets. And notice verse 22, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp, that is the camp of Midian, to turn on each other with their swords. And some of them end up fleeing, and Midian or Gideon goes to chase down those and his men. But the story is that the, apparently the majority of the Midianites, they turn on each other. And in their fear and panic at what they're hearing, these trumpets, the pots, I mean, it could feel kind of scary to feel like your enemy has kind of snuck up on you in the night, but it's still... There's not a direct cause and effect here. There's no reason that if Midian gets scared and panicked that they would start to fight each other. But that's exactly what the Bible says happens. And so as God works through their panic in the camp, Midianites begin fighting each other and they're killing each other as Israel is just standing there blowing their trumpets, blowing their 
their trumpets of worship as they're, in a sense, the picture is almost like a worship service. They're just standing there, and they're just blowing trumpets, and their enemies are killing each other, and they don't have to do it. God is glorified when ordinary people obey an extraordinary God and fulfill His glorious purposes. And when ordinary people start to do that and walk in obedience and trust that God is with them, listening to God's voice, amazing things happen. And we read about them later and say, that couldn't have been human ingenuity. That couldn't have been human strength or leadership prowess or anything else. This is the hand of God working. So that's the story of, of Gideon here in chapter 6 and 7. And sadly, Gideon, he, he doesn't learn from this. And his, later in life, it, it ends up being pretty bad for him. He turns away from God the way so many of his predecessors have. That's actually the story of the Old Testament. The older God's followers get, the more likely they are to forget God in the sense of forgetting to obey Him. And they end up turning from Him. And so read on in Judges 6. You'll read more about it. But I want to pause. So that's, that's the end of the sermon, the whole thing. I started at 11.05. It's 11.31. But let me pause and give this little reminder for how you need to be reading stories like this. So as I was preparing for preaching this message on Guinea, and I was looking through stuff, and sometimes I'll watch and try to listen to other preachers, how they preach this passage. And I, and I heard an old preacher and I thought, man, that, that's really good. I'm going to use some of that material. And I did. I started incorporating it into what I said. Oh, wow, that's a, that's a good point. And I realized what it was that I'd snuck in as I was doing the sermon, kind of taking some of those preachers' ideas. It was all about Gideon. And the theme of that preacher was God uses obedient people. God uses courageous people. God uses... Um, cautious people. He's cautious in, in his steps forward. He's not brash uh, and hasty and all these things. And I realized, well, wait a minute, that is, that is missing the point. This is not about look who Gideon was. He was the right person for the job because he was cautious, he was courageous and all, you know, all these things and God used him. No, that is not the point. The point is Gideon is the wrong person for this job. He, and when he has courage, it's not because he musters up courage in himself. No, it's very clear from the story of Gideon. He starts off a fearful person. His fear doesn't change because he decides, my New Year's resolution is I'm not going to walk by fear anymore. His fear changes or begins to go away when God shows up. This isn't about, you got to be like Gideon if you're going to be used like Gideon. No, this is about if you are as messed up as Gideon, if you are as fearful as Gideon, you don't have any hope but for God showing up in your life. If you're consumed by fear, you don't have any hope. You can't grin and bear it and determine that you're not going to be fearful anymore. You need God to show up in your life. You're not going to have the boldness to obey the way Gideon obeyed unless God shows up in your life. So this isn't about Gideon being bold and obedient and courageous. No, this is about God giving those characteristics in someone that he has chosen to work through. And that is how we need to read the stories, especially the stories of the Old Testament, the New Testament too, right? So when you're, it's, it's not like when we come to the story of David and Goliath, you're going to have Goliath in your, in your life and you need to be bold like David. No, this is a story. This is not about David. This is about God giving people like David and Gideon and Joshua wisdom that they wouldn't have on their own, strength they wouldn't have on their own, the ability to obey that they wouldn't have on their own. That's one of the points I put in here. God instills courage in His people. He enables ordinary people. His Spirit rests on obedient people. God is always the initiator. He's the initiator in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and He's the initiator in our lives today. So, 
We don't read a story like Gideon and say, I need to be more like Gideon. We need to read a story like this and say, God, show up in my life the way you showed up for Gideon. I got enemies in my life. I got things that I'm afraid of, and I'm acting just as absurdly as Gideon, making it hard for myself, trying to thresh wheat in a wine press, and I can't get myself out of it. I can't become a mighty warrior on my own. doesn't matter how I see myself. God, I need you to work through me, to enable me, to instill courage, to enable me to obey. Otherwise, I'm just as lost and hopeless as Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. So we're going to close with prayer. And we're going to ask God to show up in our lives. Because you and I don't have the courage we need. We can't obey like we should. We don't have it in us, but for the grace of God working through us and His Spirit resting on us and enabling us to obey. We need God to show up. And like we talk about here, renovation, to renovate what we can't renovate on our own. And the New Testament makes it very clear that happens through Jesus. There is no better picture of God showing up to His people than when Jesus Christ comes down in human form and says, I am with you. I will be with you. I will enable you. I will send my Spirit to empower you to follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy in the lives of people like Gideon. We thank you that we get to read that you showed up in the life of an ordinary man who was struggling with fear and could not obey on his own. Father, we praise you for seeing how your strength is made perfect in weakness both weakness in the life of one individual man named Gideon, weakness and in, in the idea of, of a weak 300-man army able to defeat Midian, not even by their own strength, but by God's mighty hand working through things like a trumpet blast and pots breaking on the ground and men just standing still your people standing still, holding up their lights. Father, I'm reminded that we are called to be lights of the world. We don't need to fight the battles. You will fight the battles as we obey. You will give us courage to show up. And then may we stand firm with a, as a light to the world, showing God's glory, not because we are anything special, but because God showed up and is working through us, is empowering us, is instilling courage, is enabling us to obey. And Father, we praise you that the best picture of when you showed up to your people is through Christ Jesus, who came to this earth, who said, I am with my people. I extend forgiveness to my people. I will die for my people, that they might live for me. And Father, I pray for everyone in this room that they would be praying, God, show up in my life. Enable me to obey you. Make me obedient to you. Give me faith in you. Give me courage to follow you and obey you with my whole heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, church family, that's all I got. I don't know how much longer the rest of the service went, but hopefully you can get out early because apparently there's some big game happening tonight. Love y'all. See you next week.